Two years ago, long-term plant-based advocate Betty had become completely immobilized, stuck in a wheelchair, and in chronic pain. She was even told by doctors that she would need to have hip replacement surgery despite her only being in her 30s. Fast forward to today, she's off all pain medication, is completely mobile, and is actually seven months pregnant, despite her being told that she might never be able to bear children. The way that she got here was by following a very specific diet along with the addition of key nutritional supplements. And when I was seven, my knees started dislocating. Uh, got to the point when I was 13 that I couldn't walk without walking aids or braces around my knees. I'd worn away pretty much both of my patellas. I pretty much tore all my ligaments and tendons. So they did a full patella realignment um, and reconstructive surgery on both of my knees. I had spent three years in a wheelchair learning to walk again. I developed an eating disorder. Uh, I had anorexia and I overcame that. And then through my 20s, I just always had health issues. One was that I had um, issues with fertility. So I had a, uh, a thing called amenorrhea. I didn't have a, have a menstrual cycle for seven years. I struggled to keep a lot of food down. I was always having issues with bloating and distension in my stomach. Then at the age of 28, I uh, was basically put in, <laughs> was put in hospital in a neurological ward uh, I couldn't walk. I had severe neuropathy through my body. Um, again, didn't know of the condition, which is POTS, and didn't know anything about POTS or dysautonomia, again, related to Alice Danlos. The days I couldn't walk, I didn't realise, but I was actually dislocating my hip. You're 28 and you need a hip replacement, which was just sort of bizarre. I had a huge flare of everything pretty much. So all the POTS, dysautonomia symptoms came back and not being able to walk, searing pain in my hip. And I just thought, that's it. She came across Michaela Peterson, started the carnivore diet, and miraculously, within three weeks, she was out of the wheelchair. She was not in pain. She could actually function as she previously could. So I started doing the carnivore diet. Um, within about three weeks, I was walking. I was out of pain. It was almost like the whole ordeal didn't even happen, just the way I felt like and could move again. Despite her making amazing progress in this regard, her gut essentially shut down. Although now I don't have the hip pain and the nerve pain, I have such severe stomach pain. My digestion is so slow. I haven't had a bowel movement in two weeks. I'm having like reflux. I It was, it was painful and I just thought, okay, great, the carnivore diet's helped get me over this hurdle, but I can't sustain this. The bloating, constipation, and gut pain that she experienced on a daily basis had gotten so severe that she was forced to come off the diet. The diet which had helped her so much up until this point. It felt unsustainable. Like, I'm like, I can't stay on this diet. Yeah, it's sort of like trading one thing for another. It was like, okay, now I can walk and I feel absolutely horrible. And I was almost I was almost bedridden just from that because of the pain. Sadly, within a few months, she relapsed again and was back in a wheelchair. I woke up and couldn't walk again. The pain was so severe. Um, didn't realize that I'd actually dislocated my hip. Got to a point like I couldn't walk to the letterbox. My hips were constantly dislocating. At this point, it got so bad that I was back in a wheelchair because I just couldn't walk. So she knew that she had to get back onto the carnival diet, but this time she did some research on how she could do that while fixing her gut motility. It was around that time that she came across my videos. It was at this point that she immediately started thiamine in the form of TTFD, because of its potential effects on the gut. I ordered the thiamine in the TTFD form, mm -hmm. and then I titrated up to a dose that felt like it was a pretty decent dose for me. I got up to 150 milligrams, and I was pairing that with a multi-B complex. It was a methylated B complex and magnesium bisglycinate and potassium at 1,000 milligrams as well. So that was pretty much my my supplement protocol and I continued the vitamin D um, and C as well. It was three weeks after that she resumed the carnivore diet, but this time she had none of the previous digestive issues that she had had before. Leading into that and starting carnivore, I had none of the gastrointestinal issues that I had the first time. Um, my gut motility was actually the best that it ever really felt. I actually found once I got to 150, I thought like my, it was like regular, like I was 
got having a bowel movement every day. Again, starting carnivore and taking the supplements, I was out of the wheelchair in three weeks again. So you you managed to regain the same benefits from carnivore with regards to the systemic body pain, but this time without the debilitating gut discomfort, gastroparesis, mm -hmm. and basically having your guts completely blocked up. So I'm very pleased to have Betty on as a guest with me today. Please stay tuned, listen to her story, and find out exactly what she did. Okay, guys. So today I'm joined uh, with, by a very special guest, Betty from uh, Victoria, Australia. Thank you very much for coming on, Betty. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You're perfectly welcome. Uh, we've been talking for the past hour or so about your story. You had uh, left a comment on one of my YouTube videos uh, giving your sh sharing your testimonial, sharing the journey that you've been on. And I just figured it was pretty amazing transformation. You've been on a couple of other channels for some, uh, for some interviews to also share your story. Um, but I, I thought that people really need to hear this because, um, you have managed to really turn things around by taking your health into your own hands, uh, and finding a solution for what was, sounds to be an extremely difficult situation that you have put in. So um, could you give us a, a brief overview of who are you? Uh, what what kind of struggles have you had to deal with? Um, this has been a long-term thing for you. You'd shared that you'd had sp very specific health, health problems from a very young age. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, what, what have you had to struggle with over the years? Yeah. Um, so I guess growing up, I was always known as the sick kid. I always had issues, uh, with my health. Um, and I'm 33 now, but only, uh, two years ago was diagnosed with an actual condition that's Alice Danlos syndrome, um, that affects, uh, your collagen production. I think there's 14 or 15 types. Um, so I was diagnosed with that, but all those years up until my 31st birthday, I had no idea that I actually had, I guess, a condition. Um, I had all these health issues throughout my whole life and they always just seemed like they were uh, not connected in any way. Um, when I was a baby, I was always sick, getting hives, um, ear infections. I had anaphylaxis to um, pharmaceuticals, usually vaccines, um, and then when I was seven, my knees started dislocating. Uh, got to the point when I was 13 that I couldn't walk without walking aids or braces around my knees. And my doctors said, we need to get you um, in for surgery. I'd worn away pretty much both of my patellas. I've got, uh, I've, I've still got them, but they're, uh, they're not whole. Um, and I pretty much tore all my ligaments and tendons. So they did a full patella realignment um, reconstructive surgery on both of my knees. I had spent three years in a wheelchair learning to walk again. Um, and then I, I through all that as well with the stress, I think, um, I developed an eating disorder. Uh, I had anorexia and I overcame that. And then through my twenties, I just always had health issues and they always, uh, they ne never sent related. They were always different health issues. So one was that I had um, issues with fertility. So I had a, uh, a thing called amenorrhea. I didn't have a have a menstrual cycle for seven years. Um, in my early 20s, I struggled to keep a lot of food down. Um, and I was always having issues with bloating and distension in my stomach. Didn't know what it was at the time but I saw gastroenterologists and um just uh, and I I didn't know it's a part of Alice Danlos and you've spoken about it before but I have a condition called gastroparesis which is slow gut motility um and at the time they just couldn't relate it to anything really um tried multiple diets through the years Generally, though, it was always plant-based and vegan, vegetarian focused. Um, pretty much my entire 20s was vegan, vegetarian. And then at the age of 28, I uh, 
was basically put in <laughs> was put in hospital in a neurological ward. Uh, I couldn't walk. I had severe neuropathy through my body. Um, again, didn't know of the condition, which is POTS, and didn't know anything about POTS or dysautonomia, again, related to Alice Danlos, and that's what I was suffering with at the time. And uh, the days I couldn't walk, I didn't realise, but I was actually dislocating my hip. I was put into a neurological ward. Um, I was having all through this time as well, I was having multiple anaphylactic reactions. I didn't know that I have a excipient allergy, which is the additives that are in most pharmaceuticals. So, so that would be like magnesium pretty... stearate and things? Yeah, so magnesium stearate, polyethylene glycol, um, and polyethylene glycol also cross-reacts with polysorbate 80. Hmm. And that's basically in every pharmaceutical supplement, beauty product, skin hmm. product that you can hmm. find. So I was having, I was being EpiPenned constantly, had no idea where this was all coming from. Um, when I got out of hospital, I was told, I, well, I actually wasn't told right on the spot. I just didn't believe that it was neurological. Um, and saw a orthopedic surgeon and he told me that I needed a hip replacement. But again, no diagnosis of anything, just you're 28 and you need a hip replacement, which was just sort of bizarre because it's like, why do I need it? Um, right. Doctors always just said maybe it was because you're a prem baby, but mm -hmm. no real answer. And then during um, COVID two years ago, I had a huge flare of everything pretty much. So all the POTS dysautonomia symptoms came back and not being able to walk, searing pain in my hip. And I just thought, that's it. I've busted my hip for good this time. I'm going to um, I'm going to need the hip replacement, um, which the surgeon was pretty much like, yes, you do. And a family friend told me to get a second opinion with a pain physician who I saw, and he actually put everything together and diagnosed me with um, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, he said it also could be classical Ellis danlos because I do have a lot of the skin issues, so uh, very stretchy, thin skin, uh, bleeding issues as well. So um, possibly one of those. I haven't had the genetic testing yet, um, but he pretty much diagnosed me straight away and just said, you know, if it's if you get a hip replacement, it's going to keep dislocating and you're right. going to keep needing a replacement because the ligaments are just so laxed in your hips right. and basically said I would need a full pelvic uh, reconstruction to mm. fix what was going on. At 20, 28 years old, this was. No, sorry, sorry. No, uh, this was at the start of COVID, so this was 31 years yeah. old. Yeah, yeah. Full pelvic construction at the age of 31 years old. I mean, you you would think that that would be relegated to, to 70 or 80-year-olds, right, who yeah. have, like, severe osteoporosis and... and I mean, hip replacements are generally for people in the, the geriatric population. It's not for yeah. a woman who's supposedly, he's actually meant to be in a prime, in a physiological prime. Um, but for you, it, it was, I guess it was, it was, it was, how did it feel to finally get the diagnosis of Alice Danlos? Because it sounds as though the signs and symptoms were there the whole time. I'm frankly mm -hmm. amazed that no one had diagnosed you with this before, because it seems so clear just from your symptoms that uh that it was there so so how how did it feel to finally get that diagnosis it was a relief because it made me go okay i've got one thing not 50 things wrong with me <laughs> like that's although i do have all these other things it was like it's still only one thing and it just made sense and to hear like i didn't know anything about alice danlos really um to know it was a, it's a collagen issue. It's like, well, that just makes sense. Collagen's everywhere in your body. So right. um, it was sort of like, okay, I know what it is. So what's the plan? What you were given some kind of a rehabilitation, uh, strengthening training protocol. Did they plan on doing the surgery at that point? So what, what happened from there? Yeah. So um, my physician was basically like, we don't really want to do the surgery, the periacetabular osteotomy, because it's quite an intense surgery, um, especially at my age. Uh, so, 
you know, they usually do it when they, you know, find out babies have hip dysplasia. But right. to do it now, it's going to be quite big. So um, he said, let's try and avoid that at all costs. And at the time as well, because um, I'm very limited of, with what I can take for pain relief because of my allergies. The only drug I can take for pain relief uh, is Endone, and, which is an opioid. And I did not want to be on opioids. Um, they have horrible side effects. Mm. And even he was like, we need to get you off those. He said, we'll, we'll try a um, guided cortisone into your SI joint and a nerve ablation to see if that will help with the neuropathic pain, but also with the pain in the hip. After the procedure, I couldn't walk and they thought that that was strange. I left the hospital in a wheelchair. Um, and they said, oh, you know, maybe it's just the anesthetic. It'll wear off soon. And then the pain came back, but almost double of what it was. And that lasted for about a month. Wow. Um, and I just pretty much thought, well, that didn't work. I probably just really need that surgery mm -hmm. at that point. So you were you were in a pretty bad state at that point. You're in a lot of pain. You were somewhat immobilized. So so then fast forward, your 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 fiance discovered Michaela Peterson, right? He dis mm -hmm. he he or he discovered the carnival diet, and that is that is that when he recommended this to you? Well, it's actually interesting because he actually recommended it when we met four years ago, and because ah. he said to me, "You sound like." Michaela Peterson and I already know knew who Jordan was but I had no idea who Michaela was and at the time I was a plant-based vegan caterer so <laughs> very far from the carnivore diet mm -hmm. and one thing I watched I watched her um her talk at low carb down under and I just thought oh my god this woman sounds exactly like me her diet sounds insane mm -hmm. and from what I guess I had learnt about nutrition, learnt uh, or been told um, about nutrition, I just thought that doesn't sound sustainable. Um, glad it's working for her sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really ever think anything of it. But at this point when I'm completely immobilised, I'm in chronic pain, I just thought, you know, I've literally got nothing to lose. Maybe I'll try it helped her. Maybe I'll try that crazy diet. And my partner kept saying to me, you know, maybe you should try it. You've, you know, we've tried everything. If it doesn't work, we'll just go with the surgery. And I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. Um, so I started doing the carnivore diet. Um, within about three weeks, I was walking. I was out of pain. Um, it was just like, it was almost like the whole ordeal didn't even happen just the way I felt like and could move again and it was it was kind of gradual as well like I started feeling a little bit better each week and by the third week it was almost like I don't have any pain at all I can go up and down the steps I can go for a walk I was helping my partner paint the deck like it was just like what has happened um yeah I I, I wasn't expecting it whatsoever um but the other issue was then it actually flared my gastroparesis quite intensely um, to the point where it felt unsustainable. Like I'm like, I can't stay on this diet. Um, I was in so much, although now I don't have the hip pain and the nerve pain, I have such severe stomach pain. Um, my digestion is so slow. I haven't had a bowel movement in two weeks. Um, I'm having like reflux. I, it was, it was painful, um, to have my stomach in that state. And I just thought, okay, great. The carnivore diets helped get me over this hurdle, but I can't sustain this. If someone puts herself in your situation, like you go from a position where you're basically immobilized because of body pain and because of like joint problems that you find a diet that miraculously resolves all of that within a couple of weeks and allows you to actually start moving around around the place but then you develop the kind of like you go from the fire frying pan into the fire pit because all of a sudden that whilst you you don't have any body pain you all of a sudden get a worsening or a flare-up 
in these digestive symptoms and they must have been so bad to you know to make you actually want to stop doing the diet that has helped you become mobile i mean that that must have been severe right um that must have been really severe but but you had had these this tendency towards these this this slow gut motility uh, for a long time, right? You said that in previous scans and things, they had identified mm-hmm. that you you had this like long term recurrence of what was it like fecal impaction and stuff. Yeah, and and like it was always if I had an MRI or anything on my hips, it even it was just like you know you're quite severely constipated and things like that. And I'm like, you know, yep, that's my that's been my entire life, and it was just became like a norm for me um I was just like yeah that's just that's just me um not realizing as well that it was because of the gastroparesis and things like that and I just thought well you know that's just going to be something that I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life with Ella's Danlos and then when it the carnival flared it up so dramatically I just thought oh I can't do that I just I yeah it's sort of like trading one thing for another it was like okay now I can walk and I feel absolutely horrible and I was almost I was almost bedridden just from that because of the pain really difficult situation to be in you see major improvements in some things but then all of a sudden other things get worse so you were you were basically forced to have to stop the carnival diet at this point right yeah so at that point I just went all right this isn't working um I'll try and reintroduce foods and at the time I was reading a lot of books so I'd heard about, um, I knew that Paul Saladino had talked about a carnivore adjacent diet essentially, which was carnivore, but still eating things like cucumber and lettuce and berries. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll bring that stuff back in. Um, you know, pretty, pretty low fiber foods and things like that as well. So I bought that in and then was doing a little bit better just with that and then slowly brought more fruits and vegetables back in um but then over time it started being other foods and you know things like uh buckwheat pastas and and brown rice there wasn't really any foods that I had off the table I don't really eat much gluten um but it was still things you know there was there was bringing back carbohydrates back in essentially okay and one quick question here when you started to re-diversify your diet um Mm -hmm. did you notice uh, an improvement in the in the gut stuff compared with Mm -hmm. carnivore i did i it wasn't like it kind of went back to how it used to be so it's not like perfect so it's still still slow but not to that point okay not unbearable Um, not unbearable, not severely pain, like that severe pain, um, not to the point where there's no bowel movement for two weeks, but right. it's always been slow. Um, and I've always suffered with bloating and things like that. So it just sort of went back to, I guess, my, my normal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going okay with my joints and everything for about, uh, it would have been two to three months. Okay. And then I just started noticing that I started getting a little bit of like a little bit of hip pain, um, not to the same severity. And then it almost sent like it was overnight. Uh, I woke up and couldn't walk again. The pain was so severe. Um, Didn't realize that I'd actually dislocated my hip. Um, And we had a two-story house. I couldn't get down the stairs or anything like that. Uh, It it got to a point like I couldn't walk to the letterbox. Um, Mm -hmm. It was just so painful and yeah that would have been after about two to three months of kind of being off carnival it got to the point where my shoulders were popping out um I opened a jar one day and my thumb popped out it was just constant and I was like okay my joints are just 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 not having it essentially Mm -hmm. and I thought okay we'll try it again this would have been coming on about November up to December and then at the time in Victoria, they the premier called a um, ban on elective surgeries. So I was booked in around Christmas time to get that done, and was told, well, now it's going to be postponed to January. 
Um, at this point, it got so bad that I was back in a wheelchair because I just couldn't walk at all without any pain. Um, my hips were constantly dislocating. And I was like, okay, I'll just, just wait till January. And then start of January, I get a phone call. Elective surgeries are still off. You're going to have to wait till February. And I just thought, okay, I'll wait. And then part of me was like, you can't just keep waiting because what if February comes and it's like, okay, now March or April. Mm. And it's like, I'm just sitting in pain. What do I do? And I'm like, well, I know that the carnivore diet helped last time, but I can't go through the issues that I went through with my digestive system again. Mm. So I just went on YouTube and I'm like, I've got all the time in the world. I'm sitting in bed pretty much every day. I'm just going to research it. Um, and that's actually when I came across your channel and it was a talk that you did um, with three case studies and it was about keto and carnivore diets helping people with similar issues like I had. However, they found some benefit but had other issues and especially with digestion mm -hmm. and that you um, had put them on some supplement protocols that actually helped. And I thought, well, I don't, I haven't been taking any supplements. The only supplements I was taking were vitamin D, vitamin C, and quercetin. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I want to try it again, but let's see if doing this uh, supplement protocol could help. So with the information I got from your videos, I um, and, and also learning about oxalates and things like that and realizing things like buckwheat pasta and the stuff are huge, high in oxalates. Yeah. So also being like, okay, well, they're foods that definitely need to go. Um, but trying the supplements. So what I actually did was I ordered um, the supplements. I thought I'm going to try it. I'm going to start taking them prior to starting Carnival. And exactly so, what you did. So that was a... Uh... Could you list what you what you what you used? Yeah, so um, I ordered the thiamine in the TTFD form, mm -hmm. um, and I heard about it can have the paradoxical reactions, and I didn't want to have that, so I was like, okay, I'll um, I'll, I'll ease into it. So I started actually with a really like just um twenty five milligram, mm -hmm. and um breaking it off and having a bit on a spoon and it tastes horrible but it tastes disgusting <laughs> like a, it's the worst thing disgusting. ever ever yeah yep so bad um so i i was having that and then i titrated up to a dose that felt like it was a pretty decent dose for me i got up to 150 milligrams right um and i was pairing that with a um a, a multi b complex it was a methylated b complex um, so I was taking that and magnesium, bisglycinate. Um, mm -hmm. I was taking, it was, I think it was 200 milligrams of that and magnesium citrate at 120 milligrams right. and potassium at a thousand milligrams as well. Um, so that was pretty much my, my supplement protocol. And I continued the vitamin D, um, and C as well. Um, so I did that probably for about two or three weeks prior to going carnivore. And then I just went cold turkey carnivore. And leading into that and starting carnivore, I had none of the gastrointestinal issues that I had the first time. Um, my gut motility was actually the best that it ever really felt. Um, and again, starting carnivore and taking the supplements, I was out of the wheelchair in three weeks again. So you you managed to regain the same benefits from carnivore with regards to the systemic body pain, but this time without the debilitating gut discomfort, gastroparesis, mm -hmm. and basically having your guts completely blocked up. Here's a question. I mean, that's that's amazing in and of itself, but here's a question. What made you, so so you said that you started the, the protocol that I discussed in that video. You'd started the TTFD and the B-complex, basically the, thi the thiamine protocol. Um, in those three weeks, kind of after starting that and before going on to carnivore, had you noticed any? Did you notice any changes in your digestion? Um, did you notice any improvement in the in the kind of 
the the like you said the base level of digestive issues that you had before carnivore did you notice an, an increase in motility or anything like that or did you only notice the benefits from the the b1 and the and the b complex after starting carnivore i think it was more once i started carnivore because i was kind of on the lower dose right and then i titrated up i found i got the best benefit when i got to the 150 milligrams um, I never tried even going above that because right. I actually found once I got to 150, I thought it, like my, it was like regular, like I was got, having a bowel movement every day. And I know there's some people in the carnivore world that say, oh, you know, it's normal not to go for a few days because of how your body absorbs protein and stuff mm-hmm. like that. There's not as much waste. Um, but I don't wholeheartedly believe that. Um, Me neither. So, yeah, I I was like, well, I'm not having that issue. I'm going every day. And it was once I got to the 150, that really made the difference. And I stayed on that um, for about two to three months. Um, and I found that when I stayed on it, I when I stopped taking it, mm-hmm. it continued, my, my digestion continued to stay regular. So you'd gone from a position where you were basically chronically constipated. You had this low level of constipation your entire life, right? But um, (laughs) there was a tendency toward pretty severe fecal impaction and this gastroparesis. So there's stomach motility. When the stomach motility basically slows down, it means that food sits in the stomach and you'd had this this history of of reflux as well. Um, And when you went on carnival the first time, that got... Uh, significantly worse to the point where you had to stop carnival despite having all of these amazing benefits it was became so unbearable that that you you really had to stop carnival um but then uh using the b1 um that that helped you it sounds it sounds as though using that uh and even even if only temporarily allowed you to start then using the using the benefits of carnivore, actually obtaining the benefits from the diet that you're eating. Because ultimately, if you've got gastroparesis, if you've got poor stomach motility, chances are you've also got poor stomach secretion and poor digestion as a whole. So oftentimes they go hand in hand. And the thing is, you can be on an an amazing diet. And this is what people don't really grasp is that you could be on an amazing diet. But if you're not able to break that down, absorb that and actually utilize that, then it really doesn't matter what you eat. I mean, this is a good thing about the carnival diet is it takes out a lot of the things which are inherently inflammatory and the things which are inflammatory for different types of individuals, you know, plant toxins and whatnot, because that mm-hmm. is immediately going to take the burden off of the digestive system and off of the immune system. So immediately someone sees a lot of benefits because they no longer have this, uh, they, they're no longer in this state of chronic inflammation. They can start calming things down, but there are the outliers, right? There are outliers such as yourself and such as the people who I, who I spoke about in the, in those videos that you saw many people since then as well, is that, um, whilst they get the reduction in inflammation from carnivore, they are still in a position where they can't actually utilize what they're consuming. So sometimes they get undigested food or this severe chronic constipation, severe bloating, severe gastroparesis. Uh, um, and, and they're ultimately in a position where they, 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 their gut slows down to such an extent that it makes it some somewhat unbearable, bearable, like it was in your situation. Um, and again, I really don't think it's a coincidence that after you started the TTFD and you gradually built up your dose and you said you you found most improvement when you got to 150 milligrams. Um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence whatsoever because this is the kind of thing that I've been trying to share and trying to educate others on um, is is that TTFD is, is one of those pretty... Uh, unique nutrients in its ability to restore gut motility and it does it via via several different mechanisms but in Japan they do use it for things like gastroparesis they do use it for chronic Mm -hmm. constipation they do use it for um, fecal impaction which are all things that you've had and it's not working via uh, simply being a laxative it doesn't work as though it's a laxative if someone's Mm -hmm. constipated it will increase motility in many cases not everyone but in many cases but if someone's not constipated it doesn't cause diarrhea so it doesn't just indiscriminately cause the guts to start moving it it seems to only work when there's a problem and that's that's what i find quite fascinating okay so so um currently where you are so so you had done the ttfd you found the stuff you gone back onto carnivore and actually mm-hmm. this time you you found that you were able to tolerate that which is 
awesome, frankly. That's, that's amazing. So what did you do from there? I mean, I, I'm guessing you were pretty impressed and pretty happy with your results that you could finally eat this diet, which you knew was kind of so so well for you. But fast forward to today, what's what's happened since then? How long have you been doing mm-hmm. this and, and kind of where are you now? Yeah, uh, so that would have been January, um, not this year, but yeah, January 2022 that I did the carnivore again um, and was up and walking and then again got the phone call to say we're going to postpone the surgery in February to March. And I said, well, that's okay because I was going to cancel it. And I said, I think I need it. This was just the receptionist. I said, but I think I need to talk to my physician um, to see what the plan is. Essentially, Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay on this diet. This is what I'm doing and spoke to him and he was like yep sweet happy you do your meat diet and um (laughs) it's whatever keeps you out of my office but we need to get you um building that muscle um another issue with Alice down loss usually is low muscle tone so he goes we need to get you in the physio so I went and saw a physio who put me on a weightlifting protocol uh which is something I've never done um never been a weight lifter (laughs) Um, and he got me lifting weights. And so with the, I guess the carnivore diet and then the weights, um, from there, I just continued that. And then that essentially was my protocol. Um, up until now, I even saw a gastroenterologist through, um, just after all that, um, who did a tummy scan and said, your, your intestines are some of the clearest I've ever seen. (laughs) And that was nothing I'd ever heard in my past ever. Um, even just from hip scans, um, he's just like, you're, there's nothing in there. It's so clear. And I was like, wow, that that's really amazing to hear. I still had, you know, I was still regular and everything. Um, Another thing it also seemed to help was my um, my absent periods. I had way more um, regularity with that, a lot less pain as well. Um, I used to get lots of um, period pain, which sort of stopped. Um, if I ever ran into, uh, I guess, a, a sticky spot with carnival where I felt like, oh, my guts are slowing down a bit, I'd just do the protocol again. I would do the exact same thing again. I'd started a low dose of TTFD, work my way up back up to that 150. Mm-hmm. I found I could get there a lot quicker because I knew that I could tolerate it. Yeah. But I would do that with the the magnesium, the potassium, the whole protocol again. And um would do that if I ran into a sticky spot. Mm-hmm. But um and then maybe maybe do that for a month or two and then come back off it. But I could stay on carnivore. Um and then I guess without even <laughs> trying, because something that I've always been told as well, because my fertility hasn't been like, a, you know, I'm told that I've got in ovulatory cycles and things like that. Um, I got pregnant seven months ago. <laughs> so, uh, which was a, which was <laughs> a really lovely surprise. Unexpected, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but a really wonderful and lovely um, surprise uh, that we're very happy about. And yeah that's that's amazing when you when you're told that you that's not going to happen then of course you may not necessarily take the precautions that other people would uh, let's say but uh i i mean that's amazing (laughs) that's amazing uh that they the I mean, so many women are told that they're infertile or that they have issues with fertility and they may have to go for IVF, they may have to do this and that and that. But rarely do doctors or fertility doctors look into underlying causes for why that actually occurs. They're they're all too quick to recommend IVF treatment or, you know, whatever, but they don't look at the very basic principles of diet and nutrition you know is it that someone is chronically inflamed systemically inflamed like you were is it that they have autonomic nervous system problems like for you you had these classical symptoms of dysautonomia pots etc and ultimately um that is 
that that is going to be one of the th of, of of the of the things which is going to disrupt the communication, the hormonal communication between the brain and the ovaries. So actually, maybe it's the case that your ovaries were just not getting the right message at the right time, right? And it sounds mm -hmm. as though as you've basically found a way to reduce inflammation, to improve digestion, to improve all of these other things, naturally, the fertility aspect of that, it's it's no surprise that it it would improve when you get everything mm -hmm. else like back in order right it's kind of like fertility is is like one of the last things to improve a lot of the times because if your body perceives that you're in a chronic state of of kind of stress and survival mode like why is it going to allocate resources towards fertility why would it perceive that it's a healthy or safe position to have a baby you know it's like if you're in an environmental condition where where everything is seemingly working against you then maybe your body perceives that maybe it's not the right time to have a kid maybe you need to get yeah. things in order maybe you need to actually get into a safe position yourself where you can start doing things properly so that you know before having a kid so uh, it makes i think perfect perfect sense physiologically mm -hmm. that um that yeah that you managed to do that but that's a bit, bit of a miracle right that's a bit of a miracle. And so now you're you're seven months pregnant. Is that right? Yeah. And how's that going? Yeah, well, it was interesting because um, we, me and my partner, we we wanted to have kids. We discussed it. But because of my Alasdam loss and particularly how my hips were, that was a, that was a big issue. Um, and I was so nervous about being pregnant. I was like, I don't even, and one of the things was, well, one, I don't even know if I can get pregnant. But two, I don't know how my body's going to handle pregnancy. I don't know how my hips are going to handle it or anything like that. And then when I got pregnant, um, it was so interesting because uh, it was like, well, this is great because it is something that we wanted. Um, we'll just see how it goes. And the first trimester was pretty rough. Uh, I had a version, food aversion to meat mainly. I just couldn't handle it. And so much nausea like most first trimester um, symptoms. And I just, there were just days where I'm like, I just want to eat bread. So I'm just going to eat bread. And I did, and I did dislocate my hips. Um, well, my hip, it was my left hip. Wow. Um, so I dislocated that and I was like, okay, right. Well, I know that um, what, what helps that is carnivore. So I, found ways to eat meat. I didn't really eat much red meat first trimester. It was mainly just chicken and um, uh, eggs that mm. I basically had and milk. I drank a lot of, um, I drank a lot of milk actually. Um, but that's pretty much what I did. And I did notice that any time, so through the pregnancy, I've had three hip dislocations. Um, if I've gone off track with my diet too far, it has caused an issue um but in saying that like i am i am still meat based uh so heavily meat based a lot of my meals are just meat um but i have been able now in the second trimester to bring in some more foods um usually low fiber so white rice and white potato seem fine right um, I don't eat a huge, like if I have it, it's not a huge bowl. It's like a little potato or something. So mm. it's a, it's a small amount. Um, so I'll have that or maybe some like berries um, and, and fruit like that. Um, so there have been things that I've been able to reintroduce. Um, and the, like the pregnancy has actually been very normal. Uh, I know there are some, you know, there's some discussion around stem cells with baby helping um, people that have autoimmune conditions or multiple sclerosis and things like mm -hmm. that as well. Um, so whether or not, you know, that's sort of also helping my joints not be so bad, me not flaring so much. Um, also the progesterone, silly. the high, higher, yeah. higher progesterone concentrations is also said to, you know, help the skin, help the hair, but also calm down inflammation and calm down this immune system as a whole sorry uh yep. that's just one thing i wanted to interject that might yeah be no that's things... great i didn't know that so yeah but so, sorry go, yeah, go ahead that... oh no yeah i um yeah i, I still eat predominantly meat-based though um right. i haven't gone crazy and introduced anything 
wacky. Um, you know, everything's whole food if I do reintroduce anything. Yeah. Um, but it's it's predominantly meat based. And the, the pregnancy has actually been really healthy. So there are a few complications that can come with Alice Danlos. Um, so usually it's an incompetent cervix is one of them. Um, right. And a lot of women miscarriage from that. But I haven't had any issue with that whatsoever. Um, and the baby's been growing. Pretty much every scan they say to me, it's so strange, your baby's bang on its size mm. and weight and everything for what it should be. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's been a really healthy pregnancy as well. And um, I even said to my obstetrician when I first saw him because I just thought, you know, if I have any issues with my stomach, can I take, can I took the TTFD into him and I'm like, can I take this and <laughs> all the supplements? And he's like, yep, that's fine. You can take all that. So, right. Yeah. But, but it's got, I mean, it's gotten to the point. So, so you're not dependent on these nutrients, right? But you just know that when you start to decline, mm -hmm. when you re, when you start seeing these symptoms come back and the symptoms that you are so familiar with because you've had to deal with for so long, when you start seeing them come back, that's when you, that's when you do a quick protocol or that's when you might take it for a couple of weeks or a month or so. Mm -hmm. And then that renormalizes things and then you go off it again and then you, you reintroduce it. Is that how you've been doing it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll bring it back in, wait till things sort of normalize again, stay on it for a bit right? and then see, like I'll, I'll come off it. Yeah. And if, you know, it's, it's still not great, then do it again. Yeah. Um, it sort of feels like a, I guess a, an item in the toolbox that I can use if I need it. Yeah, I mean that's 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 ultimately I think I think what it can be and what nutrients can be. I mean, some people find that they need to take these things uh, indefinitely, like on an ongoing basis. Other people don't. You know, other people do. Mm -hmm they obtain the benefits from them. They get like a renormalization and it's almost like their body interprets, okay, this is the thing that I, that, that I need when I, when I have these symptoms or whatever, or someone begins to learn that and they identify that and they have it in their toolbox. But then for instance, they can be fine for several months afterwards. You know, they can be fine just doing it here and there, doing it when things start to go downhill, perhaps when someone's under a greater level of stress, they might increase the nutrient intake when someone has you know a recurrence of symptoms or they feel as though okay they're a little bit more sensitive at this time maybe it's a time in their cycle or something like that then they might mm -hmm. use specific nutrients again there's no there's no fast hard and fast rules as to how these can be used and i think it's i'm always interested to, to hear uh, how people kind of get creative with this and again it's it's nutrients can be used first of all they are the current currency of the body right but at the same time uh, they can be used outside of the context of a classical or a traditional conception of a, a deficiency and this is kind of the i think one of the misconceptions of nutrition science as a whole even in people who um in in proponents of alternative or natural health they have this idea that the only reason anyone should take a vitamin supplement is if they're deficient and if they're not deficient then it means that basically the vitamin is useless and that's just not what the research shows it's really not it's there are certain adaptogenic properties of these nutrients they can be used even outside of the context of a deficiency to achieve certain circumstances for instance you may not have at any point been deficient in B1. And I think that that's, it's difficult to say, but the TTFD can work for people who are not even deficient. And that is simply by, like we were speaking about before, improving the communication between the neurons in the enteric nervous system. Like if there's anything that, you know, whether it's due to some kind of inflammation or some kind of collagen defect or whatever it is, if there's Poor communication between the nerve cells and the various cells which are which are responsible for um, operating motility or secretion in the digestive system. If there's like a, a lack of communication there, then certain nutrients, choline, TTFD, vitamin B5, they can be used to enhance that communication. Doesn't necessarily mean that someone is deficient in those to have to benefit from them. And I think this applies to other things as well. Vitamin B12, for instance, you know, if you look at the, the research in um, multiple sclerosis using high, extremely high doses of vitamin B12, these individuals are not necessarily deficient in B12, but they still get the neurotropic benefit of the vitamins. And I think that's something that um, that is is 
personally, for me, it's a fascinating concept, but I think it's illustrated in your case and perhaps in many other people's cases is we we should reframe i think as a as a as a, a collective reframe how we how we see these and actually like i think you articulated it really well is that it's another tool in the toolbox that you know that you can go to to help rebalance things um if only temporarily so that you can go the next few months or, or however long and not have to rely on this stuff long term um because uh yeah if your body doesn't need it all of the time then then it's kind of like what's the point you're taking it all of the time so that 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 is that is fascinating that you managed to kind of work that out yourself and just listen to your body that's kind of what this demonstrates and that's what you've done this whole time is gotten to a point where you listen to your body you find out which diet works okay what are the benefits of that what are the drawbacks what you can use what you what you should eat what you shouldn't eat um and so i mean yeah it's, it's really awesome awesome story uh and and i i thank you so much for coming on i really do like i was saying before um it's things like this which which i think give people hope especially when there's so little hope gotten from the conventional medical system conventional doctors whilst many of them try their best i think many of them not all of them many of them try their best they're just not given the tools to help deal with these kind of chronic problems that someone like yourself has had to deal with. And so uh, you have to take things into your own hands. You have to do independent research. Um, but hearing someone like yourself who has done that and who has really turned things out around completely 180 and you managed to avoid having to do pretty se serious surgeries. Um, you mm -hmm. are no longer taking painkillers, if I'm correct. You're no longer mm -hmm. reliant on these things. And you, you've gotten to the point where you were told that you were basically infertile. And now you are seven months pregnant with a perfectly healthy baby. Touch wood. Everything's going to go as planned. Sounds like, <laughs> you know, sounds like everything is in working order. And it's 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 been a really healthy pregnancy so far. So, I mean, you've come so far from where you were just a couple of years ago. It's, it's, it's really amazing and miraculous to hear. And more people need to hear stories like this because it's just so good uh so <laughs> thank you again for coming on i really appreciate it is there anything else that you'd like to share or anything you, that you'd like to finish up on or should we call this a day yeah um yeah i just want to say yeah thanks for having me on and the opportunity to even say my story because i think with this it's like it's one of those things where i'm like if i can even just help one person someone goes oh she sounds like me like i guess i did with michaela um, you know, it's that sort of thing, like, oh, there's, for a condition that you're told is genetic and there's no cure, you just have to live with it and learn a way to live with it, essentially. And usually in mainstream media, that way to live with Ella's den loss is surgery and pain medication or, um, you know, tricyclic antidepressants and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, all things that have severe complications and side effects. And there's no way to fix it. And a lot of people have even said to me, how could, how could you have cured your condition? I'm like, I haven't cured it. I live with it every day, but I know how to manage it. Mm -hmm. And like I said, yeah, it's that tool in the toolbox. I have, I know how to manage it and manage it in a way that's more holistic without side effects um, or massive invasive surgeries as well. And, and whether that's, you know, prolonging the surgery, so be it. But at least, you know, I might not have to get these surgeries now. I might not even need them until I'm 80 years old or something. Um, and if that can help others as well, like that's that's why I love, you know, being able to do this and, and share that story. Um, and, uh, you know, a huge thank you to you as well. Your videos honestly help so much because if I didn't know anything about supplementation or that I, I probably would have been very hesitant to try carnivore again. Um, it was just, yeah, it, it was quite dramatic. So it was um, a huge help and, and thank you for, for your channel and sharing your knowledge as well. Yeah. Uh, like you said, if there's just one person that can listen to these kind of stories or the videos or something, if there's one person that benefits, it, it's totally worth it. You know, it's it's totally mm -hmm. worth it. Yep. Um, and there's just such a thirst for knowledge. I think uh, generally people have been let down by a system, uh, healthcare system, which is really geared up towards um, surgery and uh, pharmaceutical drugs, which generally don't fix the problem. 
that's not to paint everything with the same brush. I think there are drugs which are useful under certain circumstances, but really we've strayed so far from the path of healing towards a path of basically disease management, which is suppressing symptoms. And it sounds as though the stuff that you've done, uh, particularly with the diet, but uh, the various things around that uh, has basically gotten you to a point like you said you manage you managing your condition but um it sounds as though even though you've got this genetic tendency with with ellis danlos there's this weakening or this hyper elasticity whatever it is with the collagen tissue it sounds as though that's being strengthened somehow whether that's because you're getting the nutrients that you your body is so long starved for whether it's a reduction in inflammation whether it's via a variety of mechanisms i don't know if anyone really knows but we know that it's worked and that in and of itself is a real testament to how um how important adequate nutrition is for the human body and for you the the carnivore was was seems like it was really necessary uh for some people it's other kind of diets like a uh, neither of us i th i think i can speak for you we did sp speak for speak about this uh prior on the on the call that i don't think any of us are saying that the carnivore diet is the best or the most optimal for every single person because it doesn't seem to be that way but there are a lot of people like yourself, like Michaela Peterson, like the me the thousands or the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, millions of people across the world who will resonate with that kind of story and are in a similar position, were dealt a similar hand, um, that they can use the, this particular dietary approach. And it's going to potentially be the best thing that they could possibly do. Um, and it's, again, it's just a travesty that not many people, not many, many many people know about the potential benefits, especially the medical system. Again, it's not really geared up towards nutrition. And that's a, that's a real tragedy because there's lots of people who, who don't get the help that they really deserve. So kudos yeah. to you to, to willing to step outside of the box, step away from the vegetarian or plant-based vegan kind of lifestyle and actually try something new. And it, it clearly has had the results. The results speak for themselves. So look, what I can do is I can, I can share whatever links you want me to share in the description. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say thank you one last time. It's been a real pleasure having you on and I really appreciate it. It's great to meet you as well. I think you're, you're awesome. Um, so yeah, I will, I will share everything that, that uh, any links to, to your pages and things like that. And, um, and yeah, I guess we could call it a day then. So thanks again. And, and yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elliot. It's been great. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and, uh, watch out for the next one.